I'm Matthias. I work at a startup in Germany, and I'm Gabor Horvath, a PhD student from Hungary. Okay, so let's first talk about what we are here about today. Uh, first, I will talk about uh, why is this an important problem to solve, and then Matthias will quickly walk you through uh, the lifetime analysis uh, as it was defined by Herb Sutter. Unfortunately, we will not have the time to go into details, but if you want to know more about the specification, there are two CPP talks from last year that you can go to. And uh, then we will highlight some implementation details and share you the results, uh, share with you the results of our evaluation and the plans to upstream this work if the community agrees. And then we will conclude the talk. So uh, Microsoft recently reported that 70% uh, of the security patches they release are related to memory errors. So this is a really important problem to solve. And C++ has a wide range of sources for such errors. Uh, so we need some kinds of uh, safety measures to counteract uh, these sources of problems. Uh, while we have uh, many dynamic tools such as sanitizers, uh, they are not uh, silver bullets. Uh, while they have a very low false positive rate for detecting errors, uh, they no, do not support uh, every architecture and uh, they are relying on the coverage. Uh, uh, static tools have other weaknesses and strengths. For example, they are more architect architecture independent and Usually the earlier bug is found during the development process, the cheaper to fix it. And it can also check uncovered code. So let's look at two code snippets. The one on the left is a, has a pointer, which will point to a local variable. And once this local variable goes out of the scope, the pointer will dangle, and we will dereference a dangling pointer uh, we have a lot of static analysis tools that will be able to catch such problems. If we look at the code snippet on the right, we will have a string view, uh, which we refer to a local std string object that will go out of the scope, and we will have a dangling string view object that uh, we can use uh, and uh, have undefined behavior. And while these two code snippets are fundamentally similar, a uh, lot of tools are not able to catch the code on the right unless it is annotated or the tool has explicit knowledge about uh, these types. So, but yes, let's introduce to the concepts. Thank you, Gabor. So I give an overview. The lifetime analysis, as written in the paper, intends to catch common errors. It's not a verification tool to prove the absence of any kind of lifetime errors. And it works, like we saw in the previous slide, by generalizing this concept of what it means to be a pointer. Here we call it a uh, capital P pointer. So string views are also those capital P pointers because they point to something. And it generalizes the concept of what it means to be an owner. So local variable i was an owner because it kind of owned its own memory and could go out of scope. But in the right side, we saw an std string is also an owner because it owns some memory that will eventually go out of scope. The analysis is function local, so we don't do interprocedural analysis, but still there is an annotation, there are annotations at the interfaces that ensure that you can reason across function calls. So you only look at functions one at a time, but you can still reason across function calls. And those annotations are mostly implicitly derived from the function signature, so you don't need to actually annotate your code, but you still get this benefit of having local analysis and still cross-function call reasoning. And there are two implementations currently. We implemented a prototype of this, not complete, in a Clank fork, and Kyle Reed and Neil McIntosh implemented it in the NSVC compiler, which I think got shipped with the latest um, Visual Studio version that was released. So the analysis inside the function is flow sensitive. It's not path sensitive. So it will summarize. We will see that. There are some, if you let the heuristic classify all your types and functions, there are rare miscategorizations where you need explicit annotations. So there's support for that. But generally, 
it tries to um, implicitly understand most of the code. And it happens by, it works by tracking for generalized pointers, what they point to, and then seeing at the right points, oh, now you're trying to work on a pointer that is dangling and print diagnostics. So we uh, track points to sets for pointers, and they contain different elements. They can contain noun, which means the pointer is now. Invalid is after they become dangling. They can contain static, which means it points to something that will never go out of, that will never end lifetime, like a global variable, for example. It can point to any local variable, parameter, aggregate member, something, and it can point into owners. Like the string view example we saw, the string view is not pointing at the STD string, it's pointing inside the STD string, and that can be captured in the points to sets. So let me walk through the mechanics of how this kind of propagation works if you look at a single uh, continuous sequence of statements. So here in the left column, we see C code. In the middle column, we see the linearized control flow, flow graph of Clang, which if you don't know, it's built from the AST by putting all the AST expressions in an order that is a valid evaluation order. And then in the right column, you see the points to sets that we assign to every expression. And then there are very mechanic rules how the points to set of an expression is calculated based on the points to set of its sub-expressions. So we declared a local variable x, and now we look at the declaration of p. So the first thing that happens is the innermost expression is a reference to x. And that x is an L value, and the points to sets of L values are just themselves, because an L value just represents its own memory. And then the next expression that you will see is the address of expression, and there the rule is the points to set of the address of expression is also again what the inner expression's p set was. Which sounds a bit strange, but actually, it also changes from L value to R values, so the interpretation is, makes sense, because for R values, you want to see what's their value, and what this address of value points to is still X. And then the next thing you see in the linearized control flow graph is this declaration statement, which declares P, and we then record in the mapping that this new variable P has a P set, which comes from its initialization, initializer expression on the right-hand side, which was x, so we record p points to x. And I guess that's also what you would think if you look at the source code, p points to x, obviously. So and then another example for the next line, we would have, we will see p again, and p is an L value, so p points to itself. And then there's an implicit node in the AST that you don't see in the source code, which Clang inserts very helpfully, and this is the L value to R value conversion, because we start with an L value, but we actually only use this value. And the, the rule for those kind of expressions in P set propagation is that if you have this conversion, then you actually look up what is the piece of the inner expression, it's P, and you go to the global mapping and see our P has a P set of X, and that's then the P set of your conversion expression. So it's all very mechanically, and eventually you will end up as saying, okay, my Q gets the expression of the initializer, the P set of the initializer expression, which is here reduced X. And it also makes sense, because P points to X, and we assign Q to P, so Q should also point to X. And it happens if you go through. So the implementation is basically supporting all various kinds of expressions that are in the Clang AST, which there are many, and then it works mechanically by walking through the control flow graph. graph. So yes. There, the control flow graph not only includes expressions, there are also some extra elements that you have, and those are special markers, so to say. So, for example, we needed to add a marker saying where a statement ended, because it's not visible in the control flow graph anymore. You see a list of expressions, but you don't know where the statement ended, and you need that to, like, invalidate temporaries. 
So if you know how things work within a basic block, then the next question is how does the analysis work if you have multiple basic blocks and then there's also a simple rule. So here we see something that will show four basic blocks in the claim control photograph. You have the basic block before the if statement, you have the then basic block, the else basic block, and then the basic block after the if statement. And here in the then block and the else block, we modify the p sets of p to different values. So I guess naturally what you would do if you need to merge them together is you merge the p sets. So after the if statement, what we know is p points either to i or to null. And dereferencing p would be an error because it could possibly point to null. And you can also do something clever at the fork of basic blocks because what people commonly write is that they write conditions on pointers like here. We have an f that gets a, which is a pointer. So we assume by default a could be null. And then what people write is if a, so if a is not null, do something like dereference, else do something else. So we will also look at conditions and then see, okay, this condition assures that a is not null, so remove null from the p set of a. So also on forks, there's some um, modifications of p sets based on what the condition says. And thankfully, the Clang infrastructure already handles more complex cases for us. So if you have more complex conditions like A and B, it will just make a control flow graph where you, which looks like if A and then if B nested, and then analysis happens automatically. And you will get the warnings you expect. So if you do your reference inside the if statement, there's no warning because you checked. If you do the reference outside, you get a warning. And here, for simplicity, it's always ints and stuff. But the same thing works with strings and string views. It's just the same kind of propagation. So you will have no return functions at some point. We will come to something. And then they are represented in the, in the control flow graph because if something calls a no return function, you don't get the merging of the basic block. That basic block just ends. So in this case, you will enter the no return function if a is null, for example, or if b is null. And so you know on the second line, you only go there if a is not null, and then you will not get diagnostics. Everything will be removed from the p sets by just following the, the uh, mechanics that we had. But unfortunately, it can get more complicated. So that's something that we currently don't handle very well, is you can obscure your conditions and you can put them in functions or you can do arithmetics or something and then it's not so clear anymore that the condition that you have has actually in relation with what A is and what B is and then we don't remove those things from the P set and then you will get false positives. And I think that's a general problem with static analysis that does pass this kind of flow sensitive analysis that you, you can never track like all the um, you, can, you cannot easily track the knowledge that the programmer has. You have to really follow the instructions and sometimes it can be obscured. And that matters because this crazy statement with the tenary and the no return is actually how a cert is implemented. So if you just do a simple cert with one, one thing, no end end, then it works. But if you do complex cert, then you get those problems because you get basic block checking A, basic block checking B, and then you get something that computes C, and then you get a branch on C, but we don't know anymore that it's related to A and B. So there are still some problems that probably can be sorted out. But generally, flow-sensitive analysis is hard, and you need some kind of annotations, or you need to like restructure your code a bit to make it work. We also checked some numbers, so we run this over LVM code base, and if you just run the analysis and disable code git gen, it has like a 10% performance overhead, but the implementation is really naive, so I guess there's a lot to do. If you enable code gen at the same time, so you do analysis with code gen, because this is in Clang, then the overhead you don't really notice, because code gen anyways takes much longer. And what we saw is you can get false positives based on paths that you don't really understand. You can get false positives based on miscategorizations, like if the analysis thinks this is a pointer but it's actually an owner or the other way around. And you can get 
problems with this function call modeling that I didn't tackle. These were the other talk. But yeah, if it things like those, this function did something with the arguments, but it didn't actually, then you can get false positives. In total, it sounds a bit negative maybe, but the analysis is pretty great. And I think if you have a project that like embrace it, you can have a lot of your problems solved. But for, to retrofit it on an existing project with a lot of code is really hard. And that's why we took a step back and we looked again at some examples that we want to solve and try to find some other approach that would not suffer from the false positives. So let's look at some examples again. Um, yes, the, the upper left corner is a reference wrapper example. It's basically you're returning the address of a local variable. And if you do that with an int, if your compiler will warn, if you put in the reference wrapper, no one will warn because it's not understood. The lifetime analysis will catch this because with no reference wrapper as a pointer and you have, is point to something local and it will tell you. The same thing in disguise is this lambda that captures the local variable and then you return it. This is really hard to, uh, I mean, compilers don't see it normally, but if you do lifetime analysis and you say, okay, lambdas that capture by reference are pointers, then you can track them and it works. And then there's really obscure cases, like the get example, that probably works if get returns like an S pointer, which is often does, so people tend to say, oh, okay, that line's good, but if then get actually returns a unique pointer containing S, then this will be a temporary, it will go away, and you are, we will dangle, and it's like impossible to see in code review if you just look at the line, you need all the context information. The same thing with the name thing, that which actually happened in real code, their name here returns an std string and not a reference. So you actually get a temporary c string points to a temporary, you return some dangling stuff, and it's impossible to spot in code review. So we looked at those things and we thought, hmm, for all of those, you don't actually need any flow synthesis analysis of basic box and stuff. It's all statement local. So our goal was to basically have a subset of lifetime warnings uh, that have no or very few false positives. And in fact, Clang already has a set of lifetime related warnings, but they only support a limited set of types, primitive types and a few uh, STL types. For example, Clang can detect if we store the address of, an, of a parameter into a field, and so that field will dangle, and it can also detect if we return the address of a local variable using a row pointer, and it can also detect if we will create a dangling initializer list on the heap. Here, uh, the initializer list will not uh, own its element elements. The compiler will generate a temporary array, and this initializer list will refer to the temporary array, which will be uh, destroyed at the end of the full expression, so the initializer list will dangle. So our idea was to generalize uh, these warnings using the lifetime categories. So we implemented this and found no true or false positives on the LLVM and Clang uh, head, but uh, if we did the categorization uh, not only for uh, standard types, but every user-defined types, we were able to have a few findings, uh, all of which was false positives, but they could be eliminated with adding one single annotation to the LLVM code base. But then we were curious about uh, whether these warnings could have prevented some of the build bot uh, failures in the past, so we queried the revision history of uh, Clang and identified 22 uh, commits that were fixing lifetime related issues. And uh, half of those commits uh, could have been caught by these warnings. And for the rest, there was one false negative because a path was not uh, automatically being recognized as an owner, which could be fixed with adding one more annotation. And uh, three of them were uh, not detected because the original warnings we extended were not checking assignments and we could easily add assignments uh, to uh, 
as, as a new warning. So having type categories not only enable us to uh, generalize old warnings, but also to introduce new ones. And uh, using this statement, local analysis, the performance overhead was uh, very low. So let's look at uh, one specific example uh, where a lifetime issue was introduced that was, uh, that was detected by the new warnings. So I wonder how many of you see the problem here. And in fact, it is not easy to spot because uh, the slide does not contain all the information you need. Uh, so uh, you need to know that a sysroot is actually a stood string. And both of the branches of the ternary operator needs to be converted to the same type. So the fourth branch, at the fourth branch, we have the empty string, string literal that will be converted into an empty a uh, stood string temporary object, and in case the condition evaluates to false, then the string ref will uh, bind to this temporary string, and it will dangle after the end of the full expression. So fixing this problem was uh, converting sysroot to string ref explicitly. This way we will not create a dangling owner, and we will have no lifetime issues. So. Actually, we need a lot of contextual information to catch such errors. For example, uh, we need to know the types of all the local variables participating in the expression. We need to know the conversion rules. We need to know the language rules for the ternary operator. And it looks like even experienced compiler developers with a good track record of committing quality patches can make such mistakes time to time. So it is worth to have some kind of safety measures to prevent such problems. Another interesting fact that uh, maybe you heard about uh, the C++ inner pointer plan static analyzer check, which was a Google Summer of Code project last year. That was a past sensitive check that uh, found three true positives in open source projects. And interestingly, even though the checker was uh, past sensitive, all of the true positives it found were statement local. So uh, we might be curious whether uh, whether statement local problems are more frequent or we just got unlucky while we were picking the pets to check. But uh, of course, we cannot be sure from from uh, this data. But uh, it I think it is a good indication that it is it is a great value to have statement local analysis. And even though uh, we did not find that many true positives uh, using uh, these new warnings in open source projects, but uh, what does this tell us? Basically, uh, even uh, if such problems are rarely introduced into those pr uh, projects, and if they are introduced, they are being fixed relatively quickly, they can still help us during the development, and they can still prevent some build bug breakages. So, uh, we do see the value there. Uh, we plan to upstream the annotations first, uh, so we can mark each type uh, as owner, pointer, or uh, any other category. And uh, having the annotations uh, upstream, then we can use this information to uh, generalize existing warnings. And also, in parallel, we can implement the type category inference, which will automatically uh, deduce the type category for each user-defined type. And then we plan to add the full sensitive analysis uh, with uh, smaller chunks. To conclude the talk, we found that Herb's analysis is very useful for new projects. It can certainly prevent a lot of uh, lifetime errors, but it is not always applicable to old ones. Uh, and we wanted to define a set of warnings that is useful for everyone with a low force positive ratio. And we found that type categories are useful for also other kind of analysis. So we can use it for defining new warnings or generalizing existing ones. Uh, or generalizing plain static analyzer or tidy checks. And uh, the generalized warnings uh, can have a very low false positive ratio because uh, all the sources of false positives can be eliminated. 
we will not have the invisible pets problem because we do statement local analysis. We will not have the miscategorizations problem if we restrict the use of type categories to uh, STL types and explicitly annotated types. And we will not have the function modeling problem if we only uh, rely on checking functions with uh, well-known semantics. So thank you for your attention. There are some resources if you want to know more and we are open to your questions. In one of the examples, you showed that for flow uh, sensitive analysis, you use the information of an assert to get some more knowledge about the code. But if you are compiling in release mode, the assert will not be there, and so you will not have this information. So I've got uh, two questions. One is, uh, do you plan to do something so that the information that comes from the assert could be used even if the assert is not enabled? which would require probably some hard stuff because it's removed very early in the compilation. And the other one is, do you think that the contracts that we saw the, yesterday, do, do you plan to do something to take into account those contracts into the, the analysis? Or, or we just, just work without you doing anything for that, the, the ways are implemented right now? So yes, exactly. Thank you for the question. That's a problem if the assert is gone from the source code when we build the CFG, we will not see it. So one way is you can build your software in release mode, but you might still have the debug mode for checking things. And it gets much better if you have contracts because contracts are not optimized out. They are like disabled, so they will not have code gen, but they will still be in the AST. And so we plan to add support for the contract asserts and preconditions and postconditions because they actually also kind of subsume a part of the annotations that we anyway plan to have. And then if you can say, hey, this function, it never returns an L pointer, so that will automatically be transferred into P set that you get from re uh, return values. And having asserts in the contract asserts, they will also help to adjust points to sets. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes for questions, if there are any. Uh, can we expect to see uh, a build bot specifically running these checks in LLVM? I guess we'll be good. <laughs> for Thank now, you. we have a version on Godbolt. So if you look at the Clang compilers, there's one including lifetime. It says in the title where you can check out the flow sensitive analysis. Unfortunately, we don't have the statement local analysis up there yet, but it will come soon, I hope. And then, yes, if someone has a spare computer, we can build a build bot. Great. All right. Let's thank uh, Matthias and Geborgia. Thank you.